I think Boris is still the prime minister, but he does not have the majority on his side, which means that he can be torn down with a vote of no confidence at any moment. And I think that Apparently so. So anyway, it's uh, it's quite madness over there. Anyway, we're I'll bring this up so people can join, and uh, we got a couple of minutes. Let me see if there's anything worth mentioning about the news. I was just sort of amazed at politics in Britain, but there's lots of security news too. I imagine. Um, yeah. What's that? Over the over the long weekend. Yeah. A what? Uh, it's a, oh, some it's kind a, of Raspberry Pi thing? It's a software you put on the Raspberry Pi to take ads off the network. Heard about a proxy to remove the ads. Exactly. It, it just basically, it, you use it in the DNS server and then it says, oh, this is going to an ad server. It's nowhere. Yes. Um, yeah, I do that with just a host file, but you can do it with Raspberry Pi. Yeah, yeah. And it, it constantly updates it with the newest, you know, ads. Oh, yeah. Because it's always, you know, that was Well, that's good. And I noticed you tweet some of the back. Yeah, uh, I know Firefox has changed their rules about cookies. Yeah, that's this one. Firefox is now blocking tracking cookies, so we'll see what happens here. I know I've noticed um, recently that Firefox doesn't load a lot of websites correctly anymore, even before this change, but maybe it's just my machine. But I think it has to do with their improving the cookie handling. And I know there are websites who will notice if you're not loading the stuff and then block it, saying you appear to have an ad blocker. So you might find that. You might find that your pie hole causes some sites to stop working. Anytime I go on the site, it's like they say you are you had your ad blocker on, turn it off, or you yeah. need to subscribe. I just go into developer tools. Yeah, you know, just erase the stuff. And then, yeah, you can totally do that. And I mean, that's uh, yeah, fair enough. Oh, it looks like I got a comment coming in. Is it still possible? Oh yeah, I want an ad code. Yes, uh, might as well do that now. I've got the ad code here. One ninety eight ad code from Watch. Okay, this here is. 198, right, there you go. You see it on the screen, 2X2XHE. I'll put it here and I scroll off the screen. Someone might, uh, oh God, okay, good. It's possible that someone, an authorized person might add, but I don't really care, so right. anyway, so, okay. Uh, all right, we're up to 10 after, so let me uh, just carry on with the official stuff, which is assembly code. It should be loaded up here, and it is. All right. So this gave me a little deja vu because this is very much like what's in 127. Of course, assembly is assembly, and I've got very similar slides about it, but you need to know some assembly code in both of these classes. Although in that class, we focus primarily on Linux assembly code and here Windows, but assembly is pretty much assembly. So we talked about these analysis techniques. So static analysis looks at the code without opening it to look at the instructions and without running it. So you just look at it from the outside with things like the strings or the hash value. Dynamic analysis is where you run it and see what it does, but all you do is find out what it does under one condition, and it might be that it does things like detect the country you're in and have different effects depending on what country you're in, so your dynamic analysis might not show you the whole story. So the next step, and by far the hardest of all forms of analysis, is advanced static analysis, disassembly, where you look at the assembly code and read it and figure out what it does. And of course, all the information is there, just like in principle, all the information is in a strand of DNA, but in both cases, it's very difficult to read it. So uh, computer languages have these levels of extraction. The author writes it in a high level language like C, where they can put in things like printf and exit and have like integer variables and string variables and all these abstractions that are easy for humans to think about. The compiler turned it into binary machine code, which is just a bunch of hexadecimal. And if someone wants to understand that, the disassembler takes that back down to assembly language where you have these simple instructions like push and move where each instruction corresponds to a few bytes of assembly. This is just a readable version of machine code is all assembler is. So um, you can, in principle, always go through disassembly, although some of the tools make assumptions, like IDA Pro, you can, in fact, fool them. You can write machine code that your machine can run, but IDA cannot disassemble it. But that's because the disassembler is not perfect. So here's your levels of abstraction. The hardware itself is the ultimate limit. Every code actually runs in the hardware with binary machine language instructions, and all the rest of this is basically an illusion for the human program. This is what really happens all the time. It's just the bits flipping in the binary. So there's microcode, machine code, 
low level languages and so on as we go through this. Okay, so, first, so yeah, see, yeah. You, you used to be able to do like um, bit stuff, you know, like Boolean, you know, like XOR and stuff. You totally can. You can do Boolean operations bit by bit. You can do them in C and you can do them in assembler. And you can put assembler in your C code. You can, yeah. You can put inline assembler. So is, is C still a higher level language? C is still a high level language because it has the ability to do high level things, but you can use C to write lower level languages if you want to. It, because C is the language that is closest to the assembly code. It was a, the original language, and it is, that's part of why C is so very dangerous. C puts only a very thin layer on the assembler by putting a very simple, thin layer of abstraction. It doesn't actually create a string in a way that it can really do all the things you think a string should do. And that's the problem. C is a little too close to assembler, and the illusion of a human understandable abstraction is not very accurate. And so if you manipulate a C string, the, you are expected to completely understand exactly what that is in the binary. But the whole reason people write high-level languages is typically because they do not understand the assembly or the binary, and they don't want to. And if you do that, just trying to manipulate C objects like they were English objects, you'll get hosed. So in a way, it's kind of, makes it easier to make mistakes by making it look easy when it's not easy. If you if just told all the C programmers you've got to know assembler, then the code would be better, but they would take a lot longer to write stuff. And it's that's why if you move to a real high level language like Python or something, then you're manipulating things that really don't have all these gotchas that they do in C. But the code is bigger and slower. So anyway, in digital circuits, all you've got is XOR, AND, OR, and NOT gates that just move, flip the bits one by one, and you have millions of these in the microprocessor. And those, in principle, can't be easily manipulated by software if you were to wire them up the way they originally did. So you got microcode, um, which we don't have to worry about, but it's um, firmware in the processor and on the motherboard. And machine code is where we're going to be. These are instructions that go into the processor and tell the microprocessor to do something. And that's, of course, as we move from individual transistors up to microprocessors back in the 70s and 60s. So low-level languages have, like assembler, have these commands like push, pop, knop, and move, which are just simple alphabetic mnemonics to, um, to be easier for humans to remember than having to memorize the raw assembly language, the raw binary. All right. And so that's typically what you get from compiled code. When you disassemble, you get to assembly code, and that's as far as you get, unless you pay 5,000 bucks for fancy features inside IDA, or you get Ghidra, which will actually do decompiling, which is new that there's any free product worth anything that does decompiling, and we'll be doing that in later projects. So the, what most people want is C, C++, Java, Python, something like that, that somebody can reasonably read and program. And this is where programmers spend their whole life writing this high-level stuff, and they just use a compiler to turn it into a C code, and they don't ever look at the machine code or worry about it. They just trust their compiler to do it. This is what normal developers do, because it's by far the most efficient way to get the job done. And um, all right. So then you got the interpreted languages that don't even compile. They compile automatically one line of code at a time, like Python, the way it's usually used, or Java. So you write these things. Now, Java compiles the code into bytecode, which is partially compiled code, which then runs in a Java virtual machine. So you install a Java virtual machine on your Android or Mac or Windows, and then the same Java code runs on each one. And it's a little bit faster than having high-level language directly, it's in this byte code, which you can put on a web page and they download it and run it in any page. This is enormously popular, although it is very slow and buggy. As I think we all know, anybody that works with Java swears a lot at it, I certainly do. It's very, very annoying. One of the many weird things about it is if you use Java for a while on a Windows platform, you end up with about 10 versions of Java installed all at once, and it's guessing which version to use until you wanna cry. But anyway, the, it is extremely popular, and I read someplace that the most highest paid developing skill is Java, because if you have a really giant enterprise, like Amazon or something, you have thousands of servers all over the place, you've got to run Java because it's the language that scales across all those platforms for giant clusters, and it's much harder to write, but you get something that really scales to huge enterprises, whereas if you write a little C script or Python script, that's, that's fine on one server, but it's not really going to scale the way it should for big enterprises. So anyway, reverse engineering is the process of taking a compiled code without the source code and trying to figure out what it does by hook or by crook. And uh, there's hardware hacking where you take the firmware inside an Internet of Things device like a router 
and you take it out and figure out how that works. I used to do it with disk drives years ago. And anyway, you also have compiled code like Microsoft Office and, and viruses and everything. You get this raw machine code that's ready to run and your disassembly turns into an assembly language and you then read it. IDA Pro is the standard tool here, the way Photoshop is the standard tool for graphics. The real professionals use IDA Pro. It has got all the features. It is the most complicated, most baffling, and most expensive tool. And it's the professional tool favored by the real experts. Um, we'll learn a tiny, tiny bit of how to do a few things in IDA Pro in this class. It is definitely worth like three or four classes just in IDA Pro. Um, and people spend years in it, and then they get paid a lot. They spend all day staring at it on like machines with two or three high resolution giant monitors to really look at all this code, and then you're ready to find stuff like iOS and zero days and stuff. Yeah. There's, there are free versions, which are kind of out of date and limited. The modern version costs, I think, two or three thousand bucks for the basic engine, and then like two or three thousand bucks more for each language you add. Um, so you end up spending six or ten thousand dollars, just like Photoshop. And then you've got a professional tool that takes a real prof dedicated professional and people just stare at that 40 hours a week and get paid a pile of money because you can really pump stuff out. And that was a news article I noticed today. The market for zero days has just been adjusted. There are so many iOS zero days that the price for iOS zero days has stalled at nearly $2 billion. And Android zero days are now up to two and a quarter million dollars. The first time Android zero days have been worth more than iOS zero days. So, you know, this is like being a gold miner. You could spend a year staring at it and then find an iOS zero day and sell it for $2 million. And that's one possible route, like starting a garage band in your, in your house and hoping to hit it big. Anyway, it's a, but it's really, for people that really love this stuff, it's like playing chess for a living or like being a day trader, staring at all these numbers flying by and figuring out what to do. So you got different assembly language for each processor. The most common is 32-bit, although I think the world is moving to 64-bit gradually now, so the next common will be 64-bit. Then you've got ARM and MIPS is still out there. I don't know how much Sparks and PowerPC is around anymore. But anyway, most malware runs 32-bit code because it can infect 32 or 64-bit Windows machines, although that's probably changing by now. But anyway, 32-bit code still runs. 128 bits has been awfully slow in coming. Certain internal parts of modern processors do in fact run at 128 bits, but 128 bit machine code is still not available and it doesn't seem to be any much incentive to go to it. I think most people say that the actual speed of code didn't improve much going 32 to 64, so there's not a lot of incentive to go into 128. But anyway, it hasn't happened. I've been expecting it for a long time. So x86 is what we're going to study mostly here. So you got the central processing unit and it's got registers, which are a little bit of on chip memory. We've like five or six or 10 registers we've talked about and a few others we haven't talked about. Then you've got the main memory over there and RAM, maybe four or eight or 16 gigabytes of memory where you store things. And then you've got your IO devices like the keyboard and the screen and the mouse and the printer and everything down here, which you use of course for only when you have to because they're all extremely slow. The main memory is very slow compared to the processor. A uh, couple generations back, Process, uh, memory chips took 80 nanoseconds to store a number or retrieve it, and your processor is running at something like three or four gigahertz, so it only needs one third or one quarter of a nanosecond to do an operation. So the main memory is about 100 times slower. That's why they have to have these registers on the chip, because waiting for RAM would really slow you down, and waiting for something like the hard drive would be a thousand times slower yet, so you try to avoid that as much as possible. Anyway. Then you've got the uh, control unit, which keeps track of which instruction you're executing and which instruction is next. And the control unit fetches one instruction from memory, says, hands it over to the arithmetic logic unit, okay, do this thing, and then it fetches the next one. So it's keeping track of where you are, using the register EIP to do that, and handing the instructions one by one to the ALU. All right, so we talked about that. So there's the main memory. It's just an, a featureless block of memory from zero up to four gigabytes or whatever much you have. But the um, operating system and the compiled code choose to break it up into blocks for purposes of using it. So they each allocate to each program certain blocks of memory it can use. It has a, a heap and a stack and some place to put the code called the text section and then some data sections called dot data or dot r data or something. And uh, that's, after, it has a certain amount of room to store each of those things while it's running. And your memory, your program is required to only use the memory that is allocated for its purpose. And if it tries to read or write to a memory location that's not allocated to that program, it will produce an error and stop. That is an out-of-bounds read or an out-of-bounds write. 
And these days, there are permissions on the memory segments. Each segment is specified whether it can read, write, or execute. And if you try to, typically the stack is marked not executable. So you can write to the stack, but if you try to execute code in the stack, if the EIP moves into a stack address, the machine will stop saying you are attempting to execute non-executable memory. So those are errors you can have. So you put data in RAM, when the program loads, there's static data that just sits there and cannot change while the machine is running. Then there are variable areas like the stack where you can change the data while the machine is running and that's where things will go in like user input. Um, all right, those are global variables. Then you have code that goes in the text section. These are the instructions. And by the way, I probably mentioned in the other class, but I should say the text section here, which contains the code, this is not writable. Things you are typically not allowed to do, you're not allowed to change anything in a code section, and you are not allowed to execute anything on the stack, because those are very popular ways to exploit machines. Those are now forbidden. Changing anything in the code section while you run is called self-modifying code. I used to do this all the time in the 70s and the 80s. This is how my programs worked. It was awesome. But they don't let you do that anymore, and now the years have passed and I have a different attitude. I see why not, because that is completely insane. If you write self-modified code, it's impossible to understand or maintain. You can't even write it down and read it, because it will change while it runs. So that is kind of nuts, and that has been considered a poor practice and blocked by default for a long time. Anyway, the heap is dynamic memory. You can read and write. The only difference between the stack and the heap is the stack has this particular last in first out structure that is designed specifically for subroutines to call other subroutines. And the heap is just for general storage of data. So you just put in any block of data, you have any size you want, you allocate space and use it, allocate some more space and use it, you can remove, you can free the space you've allocated so it can be reused and it's just a messy pile of data used temporarily. Um, that for data that uh, you, is less structured in how it's used than what's on the stack. The stack is particularly for program flow. It's designed so you can have a subroutine that calls another subroutine and calls another subroutine. When I started this with Fortran 4 in the 70s, I just wrote spaghetti code. The main computer you controlled everything was go to. I would go to here and do stuff and go to here and do stuff and just have this flow all over the place and it was not structured code at all. And that would turn out to be madness as I discovered myself as I wrote things and had to maintain them to get more and more complicated until I couldn't even tell what I was doing. And so what you move is to structured code, which you could do in Fortran and you're strongly encouraged to do in C where you write one little routine where you call the routine, in comes some parameters, it does one simple thing and then returns. And then your main program just calls a routine, calls another routine, calls another routine. You try to keep every process in one logical container so you can debug it and test it and reuse it. And this turns out to be far better than spaghetti code where you just go to here and go to there and execute a few instructions here and a few instructions there, which is by the way, what you end up with if you do return oriented programming exploit. That's going back, that's probably why it seems fine to me. It's the way I learned how to write code. Back before there were any functions when all I have is basic and Fortran, you just go here and go here and go here. And that's grab a few instructions here and a few instructions there and paste together what you want. That was the natural way to do things at that time. So your instructions look like this. A mnemonic tells you what it does and then you have operands. So move ECX 42 will take the immediate number 42, which is four times 16 plus two, because the zero X tells you it's hexadecimal and put it in the register ECX on the processor. Um, all right, so this is, um, 0xb9, that single byte is the hexadecimal code for move ECX. There's no one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not like the first move turns into one byte and the ECX turns into one byte. There are just a certain number of available instructions and they're arbitrarily assigned to instructions. I remember I had a bunch of them memorized back in the old, in the early 80s. So A9 was a load accumulator and there's only one accumulator at that time. It's 8-bit code. But anyway, B9 is move ECX. Then the value 42 is a 32-bit value, so it's low to high. This is little endian, so 42 on the left and then three bytes of zero. So this is a five-byte instruction. B9, 42000 is load 42 into ECX. So that's how it works, and it takes five bytes to store that instruction. And a bunch of them are nulls, which is going to come up to annoy us later. Anyway, so there's your example, boo, mnemonic destination and source. Uh, this is the Intel format where you put the source on the right and the destination on the left. For some ungodly reason, it's about equally popular to use the at and format that put them in the other order. And that is very, very annoying. So when I look at assembly code, 
it's um, there are some little hints to tell you which one you're looking at, but I just look for immediate value. If there's a number there like 1 or 42, that has to be the source. You cannot write anything into a number like 1 or 42. How is the ATT involved in the assembly language? They made their own. Uh, see, the assembly language is completely artificial. Remember, the only thing that matters is the binary language of the code. The assembly language is just created for the convenience of people that want to read binary assembly code, so you can express it any way you want. So AT&T just made their standard, which used capital letters and put source destination, and Intel made the other one. And uh, I, don't, I don't know the exact history of it, but you could just as well have more of them. I mean, the reality is only the binary here. And this stuff is just an artificial way to supposedly make it easier to read. Yeah? Um, uh, do you want to go over Units. Sure, go ahead. No, yeah. no, right. Do you want to? I mean, I, I, well, all I know is, um, I mean, is the C was originally created yeah. in 69 by Kernighan and Ritchie at AT&T because the assembly, each, each mainframe had its own processing language. And if you bought a VAX mainframe, you'd get about 10 phone books full of VAX manuals, and you would have to learn VAX mainframe assembly. And there were no unification across them. So you'd be a specialist in one brand of mainframe. So to fix that, they wanted to create the unifying operating system, Unix. And they, wanted, they created the language C to be the language you would write Unix in. And now all you had to do was write a C compiler for every mainframe. You could now have Unix written in universal C and compile it. And now everybody could just use Unix, the unifying operating system that would make different brands of mainframes talk to each other and thus create the internet. And this started in 69. And anyway, oh, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine nowadays, but the two probably biggest companies that had the, the biggest impact on computer system operations today and programming languages were AT&T and Xerox. So AT&T must have been the first one because yep. they wrote it. And I guess, so what's, what was that other company? Not Intel. Xerox. Xerox, right. Xerox. But Xerox gave up. They, they, yeah, they totally gave up. But that's what they decided computers are worthless and they went into copiers. And, but somehow it ended up in the hands of um, Intel. And Intel, for some reason, decided, that's why the, the older one, I think, is AT&T, and that's why it uses capital letters, because at that time there were no lowercase letters. Everybody had these impact printers that had nothing but capital letters and numbers. What time frame was it when AT&T used it? AT&T published this all in 1969. Or 79 or 60, I think it was 69, when C was written. Let me just, I might as well get it right. I can get it. This is the famous book I read. If you want to understand this stuff, it all started with Kernighan and Ritchie. This is a wonderful book, by the way. These are the guys that wrote C. And C, the original C, was brilliant. And I thought it was 69. In the early 70s. Oh, it was 78. Okay, 78 is when C was invented. And C was necessary to have Unix. And after this was published, and this book is beautiful. It's written like mathematicians or logician. It explains in very clear terms. That's why C is, C is mathematically beautiful. It has exactly one way to do everything. It has a nice compact structure. It's, it's wonderful to read. C++ is famous as just appalling and maddening by comparison. But anyway, that was all 79 when this came out. And that was to unify the world of mainframes, which is then brand-specific chaos, and create, make it possible to have the Internet where different brands of computers could talk to each other. And it did. Anyway, that's the, uh, anyway, so uh, most significant byte first is big endian, which is the way we're used to writing things. So 42 would be 0000042. 000 000 000 000 000 and that would make a lot of sense. But for some reason, the hardware we're all using is a little endian. So it puts the least significant byte first and the others later. So I don't know why, but that's how it works. Network data, however, is big endian. Yeah. ASCII? ASCII, yes. Apparently it's faster ASCII. because a lot of the early <clears throat> 1980s computers were focused on uh, doing ASCII on the screen. Yeah. And so the whole idea of having the little Indian was oh. like, oh, all we care about is the last byte, and then that's how. Yeah, we'll oh. Okay, well, that's interesting. Okay, I know that the network data is actually designed this way because the early networks were so slow that you wanted the switches and you wanted the routers to be able to route packets before they were all the way in. So the first bit tells you whether it's class A or not. The second bit tells you whether it's class B or not. And a third bit tells you whether it's class C or not. So you can make a decision of routing before all the bits have even entered the device. That was the plan. That's Fast routing, but yes, the same principle as switching. Yeah, that's the idea. Anyway, that's why this all had a reason in really old hardware. 
But now in the modern world, it just looks like it's there to drive you nuts. So anyway, network data is big end in. So 127.001 has the 127 on the left. But if you were to install it in the RAM in little endian format with the 127 way over on the right. So it's stored little endian in RAM, but it has to be sent over the network with the big byte first because of this historical plan that the first byte, which would be more significant if it was 1990 and we were using classful routing, the first few bits of the big byte would be really useful to know. Now in the modern world, it's madness because of CIDR and modern routing tables, but we still carry along the legacy in the protocols. Yeah. So memory's got to learn how to switch. Everybody does. Everybody has to get used to this. And this is why when you write Python exploits and exploit development, you have to get used to reversing the byte order all the time because everything is really stored little Indian. So you spend a lot of time reversing byte orders and being confused. So the order of the operands has two versions for popular to drive you nuts, and the way it's stored in the machine is kind of backwards. So you either get it straight, or you're just a slob like me, and I frequently just try both choices and brute force my way around problems when I get confused. <laughs> um, anyway, so you got immediate values like 42. You can refer to immediate numbers like one and two and three if you want to. Uh, it's easy to write in assembly code. In fact, it turns out to be inefficient, and compilers try to avoid immediate values as much as possible, and people writing shellcode try to avoid them because they don't want all those null bytes. But if you're just trying to write code to get something done, this is often the clearest way to write it. You got registers like EAX, EBX, and ECX, and you got memory addresses, which are brackets around something. You could put a bracket around an immediate value, and then it would refer to that specific address, or you could put a bracket around a register, and it would refer to that address being interpreted as a pointer to an address in RAM. So the brackets are how you refer to memory locations. So you got, here's the registers. You got EAB, A, B, C, and D are the general purpose registers. Then you got the base pointer and the stack pointer, which refer to the stack memory allocated to this particular process. So every process has a stack frame and the lowest, the bottom of the stack is an EBP and the top of the stack is an ESP and the local variables are stored between ESP and EBP within a process. Then you have ESI, which is just an index to count through something that could be used in general, like A, B, C, and D, but by tradition, it is usually used to count through something like a loop, like you're trying to move a whole block of bytes or a whole block of words, so the ESI is counting through the objects you're going to. And then there's E flags, which stores a series of one-bit flags that tell you things like whether the last operation resulted in zero, whether the last operation resulted in a carry because it, you added two things and it got too big or so on, a variety of single things that might happen. And then you have the EIP we talked about, the address of the next instruction to execute, which is the target for most exploits. You want to gain control of the EIP because then you can take over the machine by causing it to execute an instruction other than the one the developer planned to execute. So that's, that's all this stuff. The segment registers like ESP and EBP keep track of sections of memory. They are your status flags and you got your instruction pointer. They're all 32 bits in size in x86. They're 64 bits in x64, of course. Um, you can, in, for backward compatibility, you can execute 16 bit and 18 8 bit operations. That is not normally done, but you can refer to the four general registers, even for A low and A high, for the lowest and highest eight bits, and there's also ways to refer to 16-bit portions of it. And these are there, so in principle, you could run old eight-bit code, but the only modern use of them is for stack shellcode developers who have to write code without having null bytes in it. So one way to avoid null bytes is to use old legacy instructions that only move one byte at a time, so you don't have those extra null bytes hanging out at the end. Does that take longer or no? Well, I, in principle, I think it probably would take longer in the sense that if you really wanted to move 32 bits, 8 bits at a time, it would take four instructions. But doing an 8-bit instruction takes no longer than doing a 32-bit instruction. And that's why, in principle, 32-bit instructions are more efficient, but it doesn't necessarily slow you down if your goal is just to put a zero in something. And, and, all right, so here's, here's EAX, there's AX, A high, and A low. So as you can see, there's a, uh, ways to refer to sections of it. All right, so the general registers include any kind of temporary data like a scratch pad that you're using. There's no particular reason to use one over another. Um, all right, uh, some high-level instructions actually require specific registers. Multiplication and division are very problematic. When I did this in the days of 8-bit processing, there was no multiplication or division. You'd have to write your own code for that. 
Modern processors have it, but the problem with multiplication and division is if you multiply two 8-bit numbers, you get a number that might be much bigger than 8 bits. And if you divide, you might have a decimal point in a fraction, and that's kind of hard to express. So they use uh, EAX and EDX together to do these things. So you have your, your original input data and your output data spread across a few registers. Um, and those are hardware multiplication and division, which are used for things like 3D graphics rotation. Not that commonly for shell code. Anyway, um, and by convention, when you return from a function, you, when you return, you typically have a return value. And typically, zero means everything's fine, and any non-zero value means there was an error. That is a convention by C, for example. And so C compilers will typically put the return value in EAX. So everyone knows that. It is not required by the hardware, but it is a convention of most code that the return value comes in EAX. All right, here's their status. Setter is one and cleared is the other. So Z tells you if the result was zero. C tells you if the result overflowed 32 bits and had a carry bit going over into 33rd bit, and so on. There's a few others. The instruction pointer is the 32-bit address of the next instruction to be executed. Now, this is why the whole world is moving away from 3x86, because 2 to the 32 is 4 billion the same as the size of the IPv4 address space, and both in the case of 32-bit computers and in the case of the internet, 4 billion is too small a number. There are something like 10 billion devices on the internet, and people often get more than four gigabytes of RAM, so if you only have 32 bits to address it, you can't address all the RAM anymore. That's why everybody is pretty much pressured into getting 64-bit hardware these days. And that's why we're moving to IP version 6 with 128-bit addresses, because 32 bits is no longer enough for the modern uh, world. And so that's why there is plenty of 32-bit code, and people use it, but 32-bit code can only address four gigabytes of RAM, so it can't use more efficiently. It can do a trick called paging to break it up into pages, but typically, um, for all practical purposes, 32-bit code is limited to only use four gigabits of RAM at a time, four gigabytes of RAM, and that's enough for a lot of uses, but it's not enough for modern graphics applications and such, so people are moving to 64-bit code. Anyway. Um, all right, so here's some simple instructions. Move is the most common instruction. You move from the source to the destination. And we're going to use the Intel format all the time in this book. So destination on the left, source on the right. All right, so this moves whatever's in EBX to EAX. This one moves, um, let me just use my mouse so I can, the people viewing the remote thing can see it. And put it here, all right. This moves the immediate value 42 into EAX. This moves the contents of that memory location because the square brackets 4037C4 into EAX. Notice that it starts with four and is six digits long. All Windows programs believe that they are loaded at 400,000 hex. That is the virtual address they all think they're running. You can run 10 programs at the same time and they're all occupying different physical memory locations but they all believe they've loaded at 400,000. So the addresses typically are in that range. Um, and so it finds that, whatever's in that location in RAM, and it puts that 32-bit value in EAX. This takes EBX, which is a 32-bit value, interprets it as an address, and tries and loads the memory, look, the contents of memory at that address into EAX. And here's something you'll see whenever you're copying a block of memory. You have the location EBX plus ESI times 4. So ESI is going to be in a loop, like decrement ESI, branch if not zero, go back here. And so it's going to jump five, four bytes at a time because each instruction will move 32 bits, which is four bytes. So it will move the, you have the uh, start of something like a string in EBX, and you're trying to put it in EAX to do processing. And so you'll calculate that the first 32-bit word when ESI is zero, and then when ESI is one, you'll get the next 32-bit word, which is four bytes further, and so on. So you see that construction is commonly done to move large blocks of memory from one location to another. All right, you have load effective address, which is a way to do a calculation. This will take EBX plus 8 and put EBX plus 8 into EAX. It is kind of nuts. For some reason, they don't let you take EBX plus 8 and put it in EAX. So you have to put it in an address and then load the address into here. It is a strange convoluted construction. Um, in an ARM assembly, you just wouldn't bother. You would take EBX, add 8 to it, would move it over to EAX. But anyway, this is a a way to calculate something based on it and then store the address somewhere else. This is what would be more logical. You go to EBX plus 8, you take the contents of memory of that location and put it in EAX. 
that's like the one we talked about before this anyway I don't know if it's that important but it is an option so here's an example if EBX goes to B3 0040 and the AX is 000 then that means if you refer to EBX in brackets it would go here and find the contents of memory at that location which might be zero and that's what you'd be referring to yeah how is load effective address different than like an address uh, the only difference is if you were to do an add or subtract, it would change what's in EBX. Oh. So it adds something to EBX but puts the answer to EAX. And the only reason you do it is because that instruction you want doesn't exist. So you use LEA. This is why I used to write self-modifying code. Because in 8-bit, there were only about 100 assembly language instructions. So very often, the thing I wanted to do didn't exist. So I would just modify the code dynamically to make it happen. Like I would load from a fixed address, and then I would calculate the address and write it right in the instruction, and then load it from there. That's another way to do it, but that's forbidden these days because it's monstrous and insane. But it was efficient and it worked as long as nothing goes wrong. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know if it's faster. It's just one instruction. Without this, you would have to do three or four instructions, so that would make it faster. Yeah. Anyway, so you got subtraction, add, increment, decrement, multiply, and divide. You know, you've got all the instructions you might need. You've got NOP that does nothing, 0x90. Um, so normally you only have a couple of NOPs because remember the instructions are different sizes. Some are one byte, some are four bytes, some are five bytes, and some of them have to be on a four byte boundary. So sometimes you have to fill in a few bytes in between instructions. That's what NOP is for. Um, but attackers like to have big NOP sleds, like a thousand NOPs, because then they can have a bigger target to jump for when they're hunting for things. And if we have the heap spray, which seems to have gone out of date. I had a heap spray project, but it doesn't seem to work on modern versions of Windows. But a heap spray was a way to defeat address based layout randomization because you would run JavaScript in a browser. You would make an exploit that had like 10,000 knobs followed by the egg. And you would run a JavaScript, um, put it in a string, and then you run a JavaScript that made millions and millions of copies of that string to just fill all available RAM with copies of it. And then you would just jump at random. And the odds are pretty good that you would hit one of those knob sleds. You do not pop, 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 knob egg. So that's what the knob sled is for. By the way, one thing that always amazed me about this is that people use knobs because you could just use of any other instruction, like increment EAX or something. And if you're not using EAX, it doesn't matter. You could use a lot of different instructions to effectively be a knob. But by tradition, people use the mathematically pure NOP instruction that does nothing, and now you get caught by antivirus. So, you know, that's why if you look in Metasploit, they have options of using other kinds of NOP. There's a whole bunch of instructions that you probably don't care about, like clear the carry bit or something. You could just do a million of them, and who cares? But anyway, um, all right, so the stack is here to handle subroutines that are called. ESP and EBP are the most important things here. Push adds data to the stack, which means it stores data where ESP is and then shrinks ESP by four bytes. So you move up to the next one. Pop takes the current ad data in ESP and puts it somewhere like a register and then adds four to ESP, making the stack smaller. EBP stands still until you call another subroutine or return from the one you're in. And ESP grows to lower memory to make the stack bigger or rises to higher memory to make the stack smaller. So call or enter moves into a function, and that creates a new stack frame on top of the old one, moving EBP up. It saves the old EBP and creates a new EBP on top and moves the ESP above it and goes into a function. There's an epilogue. Well, the call function does part of this work, saving the EIP. And then when you enter a function, it has a prologue, which creates the new stack frame. Then when you're done with the function, you do leave or return, and those will go back to the calling function, removing the old um, stack frame and uh, turning the original one up. Anyway, that's kind of an interesting bug. Um, it shows my webcam for a minute when my webcam is not on. I wonder if that broadcasts it too. That could be an interesting information disclosure vulnerability. Anyway, um, all right. So that's what I see here. Function calls, if you're in a function and then you call something like printf, it has to store the current condition of the processor, go into printf and do stuff, and then return. So it does that with a prologue. This, um, is the, this stores the EIP, the call command does, and then it moves into, a, a, it does in the calling routine, then it moves into the prologue. The prologue moves the ESP into EBP which creates a new stack on top of the old one, and then it subtracts something from ESP to make room for whatever room it's reserving for local variables. That's what the prologue does. And then it runs, 
doing whatever it has to with local variables, and when it returns, it moves back. It restores the saved EBP and the saved EIP so it can resume instructions back in the calling routine where it left off. That's how it works. So you have stack frames. Your operating system is up here running like Windows. Then you double click on something like Word and it calls and creates a stack frame for the temporary variables in the main routine in Word. Then Word calls a subroutine to do something like the document menu. Then you choose a particular document to open and that calls another subroutine like to open the page with lines on it or something. And you're now in a dream within a dream, many layers down, and you have these stack frames. And whatever process you're actually currently running uses local variables in one frame until it's time to return, and then it goes back to this frame, picking up where it left off. And the address it has to return to is stored right at the, right at the junction between the two frames. So you have many stack frames piled on top of each other. And so you'll see things like this. Each frame is going to have a whole bunch of local variables and arguments, and it's going to have the old EBP and the return pointer. So some of these variables are strings, and if you, if you write memory off the end of a string, you can change the saved EBP and the return address, and now when it thinks it's returning to the calling function, it's in fact going somewhere else of your choice, and that's how you take over machines with a bug overflow exploit, which we're doing plenty of in the uh, exploit development class. So you got conditional instructions, test and compare. We'll compare two things to see if they're equal or not. Um, essentially doing the same thing. Um, you can jump if the last operation resulted in zero, you can jump if it was not zero. You can jump if it's greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to zero, and so on. This is how you perform ifs. Every C program starts with the ability to bring in arguments. Arg C is the number of arguments on the command line, and then you have a pointer to an array of pointers which points to all these string variables that store all the strings in the command line. So if you could copy food a bar, argc is three, the zeroth element is c, the oneth element is foo, and the second element is bar. And the fact that you count the name, the, the name of the program is kind of annoying, and the fact that you start counting at zero instead of one is annoying and lead to an endless chain of vulnerabilities as people keep getting confused and being off by one when they write C code. And this is the fundamental problem with C. C is kind of unnatural and weird. And the objects you're manipulating are a little confusing, so a certain number of programmers will always keep making mistakes. Writing off the end of a string, forgetting how long it is, forgetting to delete a pointer which has been freed, creating a uh, use after free vulnerability, being off by one by forgetting that everything starts counting at zero and so on. They're just, it's clumsy and unintuitive, so a certain amount of the time programmers will keep making these same mistakes over and over. And that's how we got where we are. So I got some cooch about that, and we're right on time. Then we'll take a break, and I'll demonstrate some projects. We can practice some machine, some assembly code. So we're here in 126, Chapter 4. OK. And my Kahoot is randomized properly. And my speaker is not loud enough. There we go. And I should be able to create somewhere to put the scores. All right. All right. All right, got a few people here and a bunch of more online. Okay, I'll wait a bit. Oh, mill log, milli log. Millo, mill log. Okay. I'm not sure what mill log is, but anyway. He managed to get he managed to get skinny font. Yeah, he managed to use Arial Narrow or something. There is some kind of uh yes, there must be like a control code to change the font or something. Neat. They haven't got a shell in the Kahoot server to win yet or anything. Maybe you could. Well, I, I think the uh, the Kahoot people haven't agreed to that. There might be some problems. They should have a bug body program. 
one of my grader, my grader sent me an email and said, one student said, here's a whole bunch of flags I hacked into your server. What should I do? And I said, give him extra credit. Give him credit and tell him he can get extra credit by showing me how to patch some of the holes. There are holes, by the way, you can see it on my project. And if you do, I might as well patch them. I'm aware of some of them, but there's probably some I'm not aware of. Hacking into my server is totally a fine way to do the project. Anyway, um, but I will try to fix the bugs, hopefully with the help of other people to fix them. Anyway, yeah, buggy, that's it. All my code is written, I can tell you how my code is written. It was written in a few hours before class by desperately doing whatever I had to do to make it work right now as if I couldn't care less about tomorrow, just like everybody else's code. So it's full of all sorts of poor practices and bugs and rushed assumptions and stuff, all as an exercise for the students to practice hacking into it. And also because I didn't know any better at that time, which is the same as everybody else. Everybody else just did what they could to get it done quickly with whatever knowledge they happened to have at the time. And a few years later, they feel like an idiot. That's the way it is. And it's not likely to change anytime soon. Anyway, I guess we can go. All right, so what does that do? Move AX bracket EBX. All right, that's what it does. Because of the brackets, it takes EBX, interprets it as an address, finds the memory of that address, and puts it in EAX. All right. All right, the person with the long name one. Neat. All right. So which command retrieves data from RAM? All right. Oh, oh, no. Oh. Aha. Yeah, there is a little bit of a gotcha on there. All right, it's this one. That one doesn't. It looks like it does, but in fact, it does load address. So all it does is take EDX plus 16 and put it in ECX. The brackets are just there to confuse you in that command, but that's the way it's really done. This is the one that fetches data from location in RAM. All right, so which command changes the size of the stack? Push. Push makes the stack bigger by one word. All right. Which instruction is repeated many times in buffer overflows? Knock. All right. Make a knock sled. All right, and which command retrieves data from the stack? That's pop, takes the top of the stack and puts it someplace, like a register. So, all right, so Kirk not, yeah, there was someone claimed to be Kirk last week, and Kirk verified that was not him, so somebody is, not told me who they are. Ken, I know who Ken is. He can actually get points. And then there's Millie. So Millie and Kirk will have to tell me who they are if they want points. You're Millie. Oh, good. Okay. Good. Good. Then you get your points. Kirk not. Doesn't get their points. They have some points from last week, I suspect. But they will have to come out of the closet to get them. And there are occasionally people who just don't care about the points and prefer to go for humor value. So that's an option. Anyway. I'm going to pause the recording and pick up at 7.05 so we have a 10-minute break, and then I'm just going to demonstrate some assembly language projects. So we'll pick up at 7.05. In fact, I'm going to stop the recording so we'll end up in two pieces. It won't affect the people online.